Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 221 for Tuesday, August 6th, 2019. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab. You know us, the podcast that's by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors for this episode include Bandzoogle, where you can go to Bandzoogle.com and use promo code GIGGAB and get 15% off your first year. There's actually lots to share about Bandzoogle that we'll talk about in a little bit here, even for current users. But for now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, Paul Kent. Hey, man. What's happening today? Hey, man. Hey, I you know, got something fun to start us off with today. I don't know if go. you saw. the. Now, I know you're a big Stones fan. I, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. And um, they played uh, a song they haven't played in 30 years last night in uh, in New Jersey. They played Harlem Shuffle last night, which I thought was cool. There's a great video on RollingStone.com. Wow. And, Jed, and Mick even says we haven't played this in 29 years. So if we mess it up, give us a break. Yeah, just give us a break. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. That's awesome, man. That's so cool. Cool song. That's you know, a great you always song. Look for, yeah, it is. You're always looking for Rolling Stone songs. Rolling Stones are hard to cover because of the style of the guitars. I mean, you know, there's just a uniqueness to the sound of Rolling Stones songs. Again, some of them you can bludgeon and do anything to and, and people they still, will still love them. Yes. But yes. if you love the Rolling Stones and you know that the essence, well, I mean, you know, it's all of them. You know, it's right. the uniqueness of Charlie's grooves. It's it's the uniqueness of how the bass lies yeah, over it. I would I would actually venture to say the Stones are an impossible band to cover. Very hard, very, very hard. Right. And then, you know, the, the, what they call the weaving of the two guitars that, that, you know, and it's incredible. Most of it is intuitive too. you know, how they work out those parts and uh, they just, uh, and live, in place. Yeah, yeah, live, it's, it's, they it's, don't not, step on it's each not other. scripted. They've just learned how to do it. That's right. Yeah. 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 So um, Harlem shuffle kind of, it's always been a cool song. What was that? The, that was from the late eighties, right? Yeah. Mid eighties. Mid. Yeah. 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 And, that's uh, a good, that's a good tune. That's actually one of the more coverable stone songs, I think. Right. Cause it's, cause it's different. It's, it doesn't rely on that guitar interweaving to, to drive it. Right. It's, it's, it's got some stuff in there, but you know, it's, it's, it's a little simpler on the, on the, on the underpinnings and the, Organ can fill in quite a bit, you know, if you have a keyboard player. So. That's just it. Yeah. Let's spend the night together is another one on that list. If you've got a keyboard player, it's like you can get yeah. away with playing that tune. You don't even need two guitars for that song. Right. You know, so great. tune. Yep. Yeah, it's a, they, they most of them are great tunes. Yeah. And that's <laughs> and that's I, I forget what it was. I, I uh, earlier in their tour, they played some song that they hadn't played in 50 years, but it was like a cover of something that they hadn't done in 50 years. And everybody was all excited about that. It's like, well, whatever, you know, but that like Harlem shuffle, that's like actually a good stones tune. Like, so but that's an interesting, from a, from a period of time where there weren't a lot of great stones tunes to grab from. <laughs> and, and interesting that they haven't played it in 30 years, right? Like they, they've toured a lot since, you know, the steel wheels days. And I'm shocked that Harlem shuffle has not made it on those set lists. That's kind of, kind of interesting, but. Yeah. yeah, cool tune. Yeah, yeah, cool tune. I had. So there's um, some. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was no, no, you say, go ahead. Yeah, I had. I had an interesting Thursday night. We played. I mentioned that we were not sure what the fling lineup would be for uh, for our music on Main Street gig in Durham last Thursday, and uh, and it worked out. It actually worked out really, really well. I had, as I mentioned, I had Matt Langley fill in for us. Uh, Burke, our bass player was there. I was there obviously. And Russ, our guitar player, a normal guitar player and, and, you know, benevolent leader of fling, uh, was able to make it. Uh, we, he was the, the big question mark and we knew that that was going to be a question mark and, and good news, like everything worked out and it was just so much fun. Everybody played well together. We had fun. We engaged, we entertained the crowd. We got there about four 30 in the afternoon for a six o'clock start. Uh, they shut down the street at five. So we sort of dumped our gear on um, there's like a little pavilion sidewalk kind of thing where we can we've done this a few times you sort of we know the drill they shut down the street at five we were able to get set up and and start pretty much right at six seven o'clock pie eating contest eight o'clock we finished pretty much right on the button we packed our stuff up 
And I was in, actually, we finished about four minutes late. I just happened to remember looking down. It's like, okay, well, that's fine. I looked at the clock in my car. It was 835 when I was driving out of there. So we tore down the entirety. We ran our own sound, uh, tore everything down, got it packed into the cars. It was 835. I drove back to my house. I dropped off my, I unloaded my drums. I loaded up my pitch slap. uh, And then I got back in the car and I drove to Portsmouth and played the last two hours of the Monkey Fist gig that I was asked to do and couldn't because of uh, Fling. And actually, Matt Langley also joined me for that. So and we were on stage an hour after we had gotten off stage in Durham. It, it was it was it was not meant to be this like heroic turnaround time, but it just worked out that things were, you know, things just flowed really well. We were able to find parking easily and all those those things. And, um, and so I got on stage with those guys and, uh, and, you know, we're just playing tunes. Now the set was already going when I got there, I just got there, unpacked my pitch slap, plugged in and, you know, just sort of slid right into position. We're playing, we're playing. I didn't know when the set started, so I didn't know when the break was right. It's a three, it's a three set gig. Typically it's a seven to 11 gig. I got there, like I said, a few minutes after nine, whatever it was, we're playing, Finally, I'm like, hey, uh, Johnny, the <laughs> singer, I'm like, um, what's the what's the plan here? Like, you know, like also what time is it? Like, I don't even know what like because I was not involved from the beginning of the gig. I really wasn't in that mindset of sort of keeping my head wrapped around everything. I was just, you know, going with the flow, which is rare right. for me. But, you right. know, those of you that have listened long enough probably know I'm a little bit of a control not a flow freak. guy. Yeah, 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 not usually. But, you know, it, I actually always like um, Monkey Fist and Chafed Gigs because I'm not in charge, right? But still, I wrap my head around it. Well, this, for the first time in who knows how long, my head was not wrapped around it, you know, which was great. No, it wasn't a problem. It was actually a really good thing. But I'm like, I, you know, so I started asking questions and finally ended with the one that was really the, sort of the most pressing, which was, what time is it? Like, I have no idea what time it is. He's like, oh, it's 1015. He's like, we're not going to take a break. We're just going to plow through to the end. He's like, is that okay? I'm like, sure. I don't care. That's fine. He's like, do you need anything? I'm like, I really need water, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's all it took. I had, uh, you know, I had people from the bar bringing me beers and, and, you know, that was fine. Like I, that, that, that problem was very, very, uh, quickly sorted out, but I, you know, I, and then of course, um, you know, packed up my stuff after, after the gig ended and went home and I realized I was, it was a hot summer night. It was perfect, you know, and I realized I was sweating from like 430 to 1130. And you and I have always said, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of music, like I like to play with a band that knows how to sweat, right? Like you you got to leave the stage exhausted. If you're not, you're not doing something right. And, um, and I thought about you and I got home I'm like, oh yeah, this is, this is the kind of night Paul would, would have liked too. Yeah. It was, it was good. Harmonies were good. Like everything was just, it, it all just flowed. Everything was great. You know, it was a, it was, we had a festival gig, not a festival, a street yeah. dance gig. So a lot of towns here yeah. are doing the, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory. Basically they close off a street and, you know, sometimes they'll bring in food vendors or something like that, tents or something, but it's a, you know, community dance in the street. And we did a pretty big one on Friday night. It was fun because we'd had two weeks off. Uh, right. But I, I really wasn't worried about rust. I mean, we, we've sure. been playing so much. We're in a good group. But it's an event we've done before. They, for some reason, moved the location of the stage. And the production company is always a little bit last minute on this. You know, mm. it's always, you know, and even this one, you know, when I called for agreed upon call time, uh, they weren't even close. Right. And then so 7 p.m. down downbeat, 5 p.m. call. Uh, five thirty sound check, right? So we get to five thirty. It's there's there's still a lot of setup going on. Then some electrical district, you know, blowing circuits on some stuff started happening, and we really never got a sound check song. I mean, basically it was six. It was six forty five before everything was line checked, right? Sure. The guy is real experienced, and he knows his stuff, and and he does a good job. But I really wish that, you know, that that peace of mind of getting a full sound check, everybody making sure they're comfortable was done because, it's a, you know, it's a big gig it was yep. several thousand people there. But we, we were line checked and enough that we started the gig and it was 
you know, Nirvana from the beginning. And it was such, you know, the sound was great. Again, the key, beautiful summer, hot summer night that you just felt like you were digging in right from the beginning. Right and from that the beginning. Energy, yeah. Yeah. The energy, yeah. you know. Uh, combined with the heat just gets you going, man. It, it gets just, me it, going. Yep. That's yeah. the, I'd much rather play in the heat than the cold. Uh, Hell yeah. Yep. If I have to be too something too hot is definitely <laughs> me, you know, a hundred percent. I'm with you. Yep. Yeah. Cold, cold is hard. You know, you, you just get, you get slow, you know, your, your hands move slower. Yeah. 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 You know, and the weirdness of tunings, you know, for us, we have in cold, Guitars go out of tune one direction and then brass goes out of tune the other direction. That's so, it's, right. you know, it's it's oh, it, but heat, you know, that happens as well. But in the opposite. But um, but it just everything's summer, summer night outdoor gigs are my absolute favorite. I mean, yeah, they just say, you know, I, when everybody's just in it together, you're enjoying. So we actually this is a week after the Gilroy shooting. Right. You said that. Uh, That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, was and I was trying good? to figure out. Yeah. Um, so, I, it, well, it, there were SWAT teams at this event walking around. So that was a layer of security that's a little bit different. Um, it wasn't overbearing like people felt they were in a police state or anything like that. And, you know, the degree to which people noticed or people felt unsafe. I mean, I, I would imagine if you felt unsafe, you didn't come. But um, right. it was definitely more. And I was trying to figure out what I should do to acknowledge it. Um if I should say anything at all. And so uh, about third song of the second set. So it was a two and a half hour gig. We played a little over an hour, took 10 minutes and then got back on. And the third song, so the first song of the second set was dancing in the street. Second song was perm Bruno Mars song. Yeah. Just got everybody back out there. And then the third song was uh, let's go crazy. The Prince tune starts with that, you know, dearly beloved, the organ thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I was right up until that moment. Should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't I? And I just, I just spent a few moments just to say it's, we're, this is what it's supposed to feel like. We're supposed to feel safe. We're supposed to be able to feel like getting together for community is a, is a normal thing. And I think the way that I kind of summed it up was, you know, the, we, we the best way we can honor the, the people who were subject to that terrible event was to go on living our life and yeah. celebrate yeah, this like crazy we thing called here. life. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah. There you go. So right. it seemed to go over well. I got some nice comments about it and nice. the guys in the band reacted well to it. And so uh, I, I right up to the last second, I was like, do I, do I, do I, don't I? Well, that's and, the and, right. Uh, I, th I mean, just like what we, you know, said a few days before on the show last week, it like you need to feel that moment out. Like you, if you, you can't decide that going in, like you can mm -hmm. decide what it's going to be. If, it's a yes. Right. Mm -hmm. But but if it, you, I, you need to. Yeah. You need to make that call in the moment. I, I think it felt organic. Yeah. It felt true. It felt yeah. real. It felt, didn't feel, you know, grandstanding or, you know, so. Right. And, right. you know, you're right. If you pre-plan those things, a lot of times you overthink them and you can have that tone of preachy and, you know, not too many people are coming to see a cover band to hear the leader preach. Right. So I, uh, Rare, rarely, I, yeah. rarely. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, it, this one worked for us, which was pretty good. Well, that's hey, good, I wanted man. to talk about, I, there's yeah. been some chatter on our, um, on our Facebook page about this music festival in Santa Cruz. So we're going to talk about that. We have a question from Martin about how to deal with a player without the pocket. And then mm. if we have time, we'll might talk about, uh, the ever evolving song list and what pace that should be. Yeah. First though, I want to talk about our sponsor for this episode, which is Banzoogle. Banzoogle built by musicians for musicians. It's an all in one platform that makes it super easy to build a beautiful website for your music. And it works, right? They power the websites for tens of thousands of musicians around the world Weekend Warriors to Grammy winners to the house rockers, no less. Yeah, right. Like, absolutely. and they've got all kinds of stuff. They, they know what you need, right? They can host your custom domain name. They've got the templates so that you don't have to think about, you know, starting from, from a blank page, right? They've got all the tools to sell your music and your merch commission free. And they keep adding things. And today, yes, today they added their commission free fan subscription platform, right? So now, and it's part of all the plans there, 
right? Available to all three tiers of Banzoogle accounts. And as I said, 100% commission free. What it is, is it allows you to offer an online fan club right there on your website. And you can choose what you want. Like you can have stuff only for the people that are, you know, active members of your fan club. So you could have blog feeds and videos and, you know, special music tracks, photos, a store, uh, or any other components can all be sort of placed, you know, uh, as part of this subscription, which is really, really cool. If you want to, I mean that, you know, once you have a fan, that's someone that can help you down the road. Now you need to do it appropriately. You need to price it in a way that works for your fans and works for you and doesn't overdo it and doesn't underdo it and all of that stuff. And that's what Banzoogle's right there to do. They make implementing this super, super easy. They like to say that their goal over at Banzoogle is to develop relevant tools for their members that build direct to fan relationships and then ultimately make you money. Right. That's the, the part of the point, uh, certainly for what we talk about here on this show. It's all about taking what you do and making it a lucrative venture for yourself and a, a worthwhile venture in many ways, financially, among others. So you got to check this out. Go to bandzoogle.com and then you're going to try it for 30 days because they offer you a 30 day trial for free. So bandzoogle.com gets you that. Then use promo code GIGGAB, G-I-G-G-A-B. And you get 15% off your first year. So you got to check it out. Banzoogle.com, promo code GIGGAB for 15% off your first year. Our thanks to Banzoogle. For yeah, absolutely. House Rockers were using it before they were a sponsor. So I can definitely give a, absolutely. a non-biased endorsement. We're so happy with it. And what you'll do with those first 30 days is you'll see how easy it is to build your site. You know, you can play with the different templates that they have. You're not going to you know, probably publish your site for 30 days with them on a trial, but you can spend that time just kind of playing with all the different widgets. You know, let's be real. Outside of seeing you live, your website is your best marketing tool. And so to have a plan that gets all the you know subtle animations, you know, allows you to get video in there so easily, that's what's going to help get your band booked. And so the tools are great. If you have a flat website that looks like it came from 1990, you're probably not being very competitive in the marketplace, no matter how good your music is. So this is going to be the easiest way for you. And remember, Facebook is not your friend, right? Facebook is going to charge you to get access to your own fans, build your own fan base in the property that you own and control your destiny. And the band Zoogle product, the service has been absolutely great and incredibly valuable for us. So I recommend it highly. Sweet. Yeah. Thanks, band Zoogle. They rock. Um, I want to answer Martin's question here. It's a very, it's, it's, um, I think it's, I'm guessing it's something everyone has dealt with uh, as, as a musician from time to time. And even as a drummer, I have actually felt uh, dealt with this. Martin writes, what do you do when the drummer can't find the pocket for an entire gig? Simple question. Um, I've, I'm sure I've been party to this unknowingly when I'm that drummer. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not perfect. And I've had those gigs where it's just like super hard to find. But when you're playing with a player who's like that, man, it like it can be really frustrating. Uh, I, you know, I don't I don't know what you do in, you know, um, in the moment to deal with that. Uh, there's things you can, you know, address after the fact, including repl- like, you know, going as far as replacing that person. Right. But I, I've experienced, I, I have experienced it with drummers. I experience it more frequently because I don't tend to play with drummers as much as I play with other musicians, but I've, I've, you know, I've sang for bands and, and just so everybody knows any of the drummers that I'm, I'm not going to name them by name, of course, <laughs> but, but, um, and, and I have sang lead with, with bands that Paul and I have played in together. Those drummers aren't on this list that that that's that's not who I'm referring to, just in case anybody thinks they can They're guess listening. anybody yeah. thinks they can guess who this is. Um, you might be able to, but that's not the that's not the people. Um, but I, I experience it with rhythm guitar players, not all of them, of course, but but that's where I tend to experience it the most. And for, for whatever reason, the way I listen when I play, whoever's playing rhythm guitar is someone I find myself really locking in with. And if that person is dragging the tempo either, you know, down or up, it can like it can be really difficult for me to. Wait, wait so let's let's just pause yeah. for a second here. Yeah. You're de- you're determining pocket as tempo. I'm determining pocket as groove. OK, sure. 
I mean, so, pocket I, is pocket is tempo, right? Like pocket is tempo. I, I think I think that's where it starts. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I mean, it, because if you're not if if you're playing in time, things like they things are going to be pretty. Yeah, I mean, there are there certainly there are degrees of of feeling great when playing in time but like even the the worst example of playing in time still feels pretty good got it in comparison at least to me all right fair enough i was i was i was understanding the question differently so so this is different because i can say i i don't think i've ever played with i don't think i've ever played with a drummer who couldn't find pocket Mm. for an entire night yeah right right like you know I, I would say you'd have to be impaired. Yeah, right. Pretty, pretty badly. Yeah. So you lock in with a with a rhythm guitar player for tempo. And this is this is the age old question though. It, it, does the does the drummer set the tempo or follow the tempo? I mean, when you say you have a uh, someone dragging you down, I always wonder. But you're the drummer. You, you know, you set the tempo and you keep the tempo consistent, regardless of whatever other people do. And if they slow down, you're pulling them along with you. F that. No way. No, that no, 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 no. It, it the tempo is everyone's job, right? Like it and and should be. We've I mean, we've talked about this on the show. If the band is naturally speeding F up, that the drummer should speed up, right? Like they, they they're that that is like that's a thing, right? So everybody's responsible for tempo. I think um, certainly I can hold it back if I'm feeling the band speed up, or I can push it forward if I feel the band dragging. But that often creates a problem with the pocket, right? Like now you're you're fighting with each other, and that's not good. But I I will I, I will I will catch myself if I if I'm locked in with a rhythm guitar player and that person has a tendency to speed up, I will speed up right along with them. Yeah. Um, you know, especially if I'm if there's other stuff going on, like if I'm singing or anything like that. And and that's not again that's not nec- that isn't necessarily a bad thing. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the pocket's falling apart. It just means that the pocket is, you know, sort of organically moving. Mm -hmm. But if a rhythm guitar player can't stay in, like stay in that pocket. So maybe, maybe here's, you know, to your example, tempo and pocket might be different things because you can play in the pocket and accelerate throughout a tune. Right. But, um, but if, if it's, if the groove's not there, then, uh, it's a real drag. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say if, if a guy, if a guy has, anyone can have one bad night. Oh, if you have of more course. Than one bad night, yeah. <clears throat> if you have one, more than one bad night, you're, you're, you know, your chops aren't where they need to be for this group. And then you got to figure out if it's the right guy. Right. And if, it, and also you got to look around and see if the whole band is feeling it the same. We had a drummer early in, in our life that, uh, that uh, almost consistently in any kind of a, any tempo of the song, when he did a fill, he would speed up after his fill. Drove the horn players crazy. We're trying to who were trying to solo over it, right? Yep. And um, but it was consistent, and it was agreed upon by the whole band that this is this is the way the guy plays. Sure. And it, and it just wasn't going to work. So I guess relative to the question is is it, is it a bad night? You know, where someone's just not locked in for whatever reason, not comfortable, something going on in their personal life, drunk, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, is it is it a one off? Or is there consensus and consistency to the problem? And, well, and you know, is the then person there aware, is, right? Like, I mean, I've certainly had gigs. Well, I mean, this I've, guy denied. Well, when we had this one guy who sped up after every fill, he swore, you know, he he couldn't look himself in the mirror and accepted it. And, you know, we we play, you know, videos for him and show him. And, and um, it's well, just looking in the mirror is a hard thing for a lot of people. Yeah, that's an easy like that's a very th- that particular thing of speeding up through fills is so common, right? Like it, it, I feel like it's something every drummer needs to learn how to deal with some usually intentionally. Some people might just figure it out on their own. Right. But but certainly for me, it was OK. Like I've got lots of my stuff together, but I'm speeding up during fills. OK, how do I solve that problem? And there's and, you know, the ways you solve that problem are. You play with a click and you play four bars of groove and four bars of fill, right? So that you're not just playing a three beat fill or something, but you know, you're, you're basically grooving as a fill as opposed to grooving as a, as just a beat. 
and you learn how to, you know, how to put some breath into your fills, how to make them the same as the groove. And but it's a learned part of your, you know, skill set. It's it like to me, that's it. It's a bad thing, but it's a very fixable and be very normal too. like it surprises me that that he would have like never come around on that. I mean, I could see you tell him, dude, you're speeding up during your fills. He'd say, yeah, you know. Screw you. Forget it. You know, no, I'm not. But then like a week later, it's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I am. He, that guy was right. Crap. OK, how do I fix it? Right. Like th- those kinds of things. I, I can see that happening. But, huh, that's too bad. Yeah, because that's a fixable problem pretty easily, you, too. You know, title the episode F that F that <laughs> <laughs> I might. You never know. Let's see, what, let's, let's see, let's what, see where uh, we go. What graphic, <laughs> what graphic you get for that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I, um, I, but I, but yeah, in terms of, in terms of time, like the band needs to keep time together. If you are relying on the drummer to be, you know, the, the only person keeping time, that's not a good band. That's not the right band. Mm. Uh, I mean, certainly the drummer needs to be able to, to, to keep time and play in the groove, but so does everybody else. If you've got a bass player that can't, if you've got a rhythm guitar player that can't, heck, if you've got a, a, a soloist, be it a horn player or a guitar player, or whatever, that can't, that is, you know, speeding up their, their solos or slowing down their solos and not playing those in the groove, that's also bad, right? I, I, I 100% agree with that. My, my point was the, the bedrock foundation of time, right? Mm. I, I follow the drummer. There's nobody else on stage that follows. Well, they, right. If the drummer is not locked in with the band time-wise, regardless of whose fault that is, whether it's the drummer's fault or somebody else's fault or, or whatever, that's a disaster. Yeah. It, it, like Because the drummer is the one that is playing, generally speaking, playing you know the most percussively, right? And so if that person, you know, if the snare on, you're playing like in a straight groove or whatever, and the snare on two and four, uh, is different from where someone else is playing it. You, you, you know, like it can't be that test. So from that standpoint, I agree with you, right. You're going to, you're going to lock in with the drummer first and then, you know, but, but as the drummer, you're like, well, I don't just want to be locked in with myself. That's, that's no bueno. You want to be locked in with everybody. And and Absolutely. so, you know, so there needs to be that. And, and I guess that's just a, it's just a perspective thing, right? Um, having been on stage playing various instruments, mostly drums, but, you know, sometimes just singing. I've played keys for some gigs. Uh, I've never really played guitar or bass for an entire gig. I've, I've been forced to do it for a few songs here and there, but, um, but you know, you, you, and that's actually what a, what a humbling thing that was for me when I'd started playing guitar and I'd been playing drums for whatever, let's say 30 years, right. I'd sorted out most tempo issues. I mean, I'm not perfect by any stretch, but I'm at least aware of, of where things are and then started playing guitar. And it was like, I had to relearn how to keep time. Mm-hmm. It was like, it's, this is not the same thing. Well, Cause you need your different limbs to do different things. Yeah, in time. Exactly. Right. It's like, Oh, where, where can the time sit in my body? Like, Whoa, that was, it was, yeah, really, really interesting. Um, <laughs> to to sort of face that reality like oh crap i don't get to take that skill with me okay right, right. got it right this sucks <laughs> so yeah so the answer to the question is what do you do and the the thing is you you know is the whole band in the same position is it a one off thing is it endemic and does yeah. the whole band agree that it's endemic and and if you if you tape a show and kind of share you know the issues there are, there are really cool online tools now where you can just play a piece of music and it'll give you the beats per minute. And, you know, you, you can actually see in real time how how your band's meter is changing over the course of a song. Mm-hmm. I always think, you know, if you went to the effort to hire the guy, there must have been something that you liked about the guy, whether he was a friend or just he was the best one who auditioned at the time. Always try to help somebody get, get to good. Uh, if they're not willing to, that's bad. If they're not able to, that's bad. What and, if he's uh, the band you know, leader? You're, you're, so you're looking at it from your well, standpoint. Yep, well, then, well if, you're, if he's if he's the band leader, you, you're, it's your choice. You signed up That's for this, true. right? Yep. You can quit. You can quit. You can leave. That's right. Yeah, there's, yeah. You know, there's a lot of situations where you know I've heard of where guys join a band and don't feel that musician that the band leader is a good enough musician, and they're like, you know, 
Uh, sometimes they try and coup <laughs> yes. and take it over. You know, I, I, I think I told you this one story. One of the great local bands here. Um, the band leader is was is a very good, solid musician, but you know maybe not a virtuoso, right? Sure. And he hired a he hired a guitar player after the band had been together many years, who was a virtuoso, but a bit of a problem child. And uh, eventually, uh, they came to head, and the guy was like, "You're not good." The guitar player was like, "You're not good enough to play in your own band." And the guy was like, "Well, that's too bad because it's my band, and you're fired." So yeah. uh, they fire the guitar player, and years go by, and their time goes by, and they. Um, uh, the band has a headline gig at a big resort uh, up at Lake Tahoe. The big marquee outside the resort is, you know, New Year's Eve extravaganza, name of band under that, right? And the band does sound check, and then they all go their own way for dinner. And as they're walking down the street, the band leader encounters this guitar player. And remember, it's years later. Sure. So they kind of have a, you know, congenial, you know, chat, catch up. And uh, the band leader says, so you playing any music? He says, no, nah, man, you know, I never really found the right thing after that. And the guitar player says, are you playing any music? And, and the band leader just points to the marquee and says, yep, we're doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been in, in that scenario uh, where, you know, I've been in a band where the band leader is is not as good as all the people that he or she has hired. And I mean, part of that is the sign of a good leader, right? <laughs> like uh, hiring people that being comfortable with with hiring people that are better than you. Um, it, rarely has it come to a head. I can think of one scenario where like that that coup mentality started to sort of foment itself. And there are other reasons for that. If the person's a good leader, generally, that's not going to happen. Um, and I say generally because it, it like in the scenario you described, it sounds like, you know, this person probably is a good band leader. But this particular musician that, that had a problem with him maybe just has problems with with more than just that People. one person. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but but when the whole coup develops, that's usually the sign of, of somebody that really doesn't have a handle on their own band. Um and and I've been in that scenario and it's it's not fun and it's not like I guess I've been involved enough in the leadership of bands over the years that I I grok the value of the person, you know, having someone who is effectively the band's manager. Right. For for lack of a, a better term, but somebody that's driving the bus, furthering the band as a whole forward taking the time, booking the gigs, coordinating stuff, like whatever needs to be done in that scenario with original, with an original band, it's, you know, pushing the band and all this, like there's various different jobs depending on what your band's goals are and all of that. But if you don't have someone doing that, you can say you have a band, but you don't have a working band. You don't have mm -hmm. a going concern. Right. So, yeah. you know, when I've been in those scenarios and it's like, wait a minute, this is devolving. I, you know, and I and you can just like fast forward and say, OK, let's take, you know, person A, the leader of the band. Let's pretend like we're going to take him or her out of the picture. Who's going to get us the gigs? Who's going to you know what? There's a lot of jobs that person does. And, you know, if we're actually thinking about replacing that person, even if that's like a doable thing, is that smart? Like, are we should that happen? And being a leader is a thing. It's not only it's a set a of thing. tasks. It's yeah. also, you know, it, 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 it really does help a band. You know, it, it helps an organization. Mm -hmm. Leaders are a benefit. Sometimes leaders are heavy handed and, you know, that's the style and it works and they can get it done. Sure. Sometimes they're the, you know, every, you know, coalesce Cheerleader. all yeah. great talents. Right. Yep. They, it, but it, it's a set of skills. And I, and, you know, I, We've talked about bands that are pure democracies hard, you know, because it's never a pure democracy because there's always, you know, the guys who don't speak up as much and the guys Correct. who speak up more and, you know, those types of things. And maybe the guys who don't speak up as much are fine with that and they would have been fine with a leader too. But, I mean, being a leader is a thing. It's a set of skills. It's a set of technical skills. It's a set of social skills. Um, it's a set of business skills. And, and it's uh, – well, it, it takes thing, effort. Right? It's a, and and awareness and all of the, some things that just aren't required for for, for sure. everyone else. Yeah, and yeah. and so when I've seen that happening, I've uh, at least in the one case that I can think of where it really started to devolve, I just stepped out. I was like, you know what, like this this is not the right scenario for me. 
And and neither is the one that we are fast forwarding towards. Like I don't want that scenario either. So yeah. I'm you know I'm I'm good. Thanks. I'll find another band leader so that I can like do my business during the day and not have to worry about it, and then just go play in bands. You know exactly. when I like to. Yeah, but but it takes. I mean, like, could I have done that when I was seventeen? I don't I don't know that I would have seen that then. Thankfully, I I wasn't in a, a scenario where that was a problem at seventeen. But, um, you know, this is more like 37 or something, but, uh, yeah, like, you know, ego and testosterone and lack of experience, lack of wisdom, all of those things make it easy to think that, oh, I can do it. And sometimes you just can, right? Like sometimes you're like, all right, we fired the leader. Now one of us has to be the leader. Then that can work out great. As long as somebody is stepping into whatever role is necessary for the band that is now being vacated. So. Yeah, that's it. Again, leader doesn't mean he does everything, but it might right. mean he distributes the tasks, you know, efficiently and copacetically and, you know, everybody feels good in terms of their buy-in. But right. a good leader makes a difference. But, hey, we've only got a few minutes left, but I wanted to go back to F that, man. <laughs> okay. We're going to talk about F that. I don't know if you saw, but there's um, been some noise. Someone posted it on our Facebook page about the Santa Cruz Music Festival. Oh, Yeah. Um, it actually is, has picked up some national attention, but there's a lot of conversation locally because it's Santa Cruz, California, which is close to where I am. It's a music festival. And, and let me say this. Santa Cruz is a great music town. You know, on, on, over there along the coast, the Northern California coast, uh, you know, kind of Monterey Bay area, Santa Cruz would be the northern end of the Monterey Bay area. Um, there's, there's a great appreciation for music. People go out and see live music. They support live music. It's a really good music area. This festival has come in and it's been running for six years. And the noise that was made this year was that they um, do not pay the local acts. They pay their headliners, but they do not pay their local acts. Zero. Not only that, as a local act, you don't even get a full pass to the event to, to go see the headliners. Not only that, they expect you to sign a radius clause that say you won't play around the area for X amount of time before or after the event seems pretty onerous. Now, I don't know. I don't know the the owners or operators of this particular festival, but I do know that they've summarily ticked off the working musician community in, in the South Bay area here and a lot of chatter and they're not getting very good. Uh, and, and not only is it, we won't play that it's, we're going to tell people to boycott it. We're going to actually tell consumers that this is what they're doing. So, just as a PR tact, it doesn't make sense. And the festival has pretty, pretty grand, you know, aims. They want to have a hundred acts, right? Right. So this is that old, old situation that we talk about all the time. Like the professional musicians will say, no, you, you free is not a reasonable proposition. You know, exposure is not a reasonable proposition. And, you know, you do that. And then the, then the professional musicians generally agree on that unless it's in a really unusual situation. But then there's always somebody who goes into those slots. I've never heard of, a, of an event not happening because they couldn't find a musician to play it. You know, there's always that thing. So, you know, the question is, is what can the professional musicians do? I mean, you know, you can get uh, I, the one guy I know actually refers to musicians who will take those types of gigs as scabs to use a union labor. Yeah, in, sure. In paradigm that's might be accurate, might be harsh, but you know, that, that exists. You know, I know I would say that if I was to come out against something, I would say I won't, I won't refer to a band that takes a gig like that. That would be yeah. the first thing that I would say. I, I mean, that would be one remedy that I would have. Actually, I think the first thing I would say is F that. Like, that, <laughs> <laughs> seriously. <Woo! like> what? <laughs> I, I, I mean, any one of those things is a is a scenario where you want to like question the contract. When when somebody says oh, we want you to pay, we want you to play and not get paid. It's like, OK, why? Right. Or uh, we will, you know, we're going to give you passes to the festival, even if you are getting paid, like we're going to give you passes to the festival, but they're not fully fledged passes. Why? Like, I mean, seriously, why? Like, what's it cost you to keep me out of there? Like, how many musicians are there that this would be a problem for you? Right. Like, and then the radius clause, I, I, even if you're getting paid and you're getting full passes to the festival, a radius clause starts to it's like well onerous yeah. it's a little onerous 
you know, put them all together. I, and I saw some of the comments from some of the, you know, from the like the organizers of the festival who were saying, you know, anybody who challenges our radius clause like or, or contacts us like this is just a boilerplate. It's a negotiable agreement. And that's a good lesson here. Right. If you get some agreement and you find any one clause in it that seems onerous or unfair or just doesn't fit with your world, don't feel like you have to accept it. If someone has put together a contract, they are adult enough. I, my assumption, I could be wrong about this, right? But my assumption is that if someone lays a contract down in front of me, they are adult enough to know that, like, there's a reason for this contract. And one of the reasons is to make sure we're all on the same page, you know, figuratively and quite literally. And if we're not, the contract is a great place to spell out what that page should look like and that it's negotiable or at least it's questionable. Right. And I've certainly well, been in scenarios where somebody's laid a contract in front of me and I've questioned a point and they've said, yeah, look, um, this is not negotiable. This is just how it is. But I like don't be afraid to ask. That said, I, I agree with that in ahead. general. Yeah. Right? I but agree well, but with, with this one, everything was on it. It was like, why even bother? Like, well, how that's many, the thing. even yeah. if you could negotiate for yourself out of those clauses, get paid, you know, get rid of the radius clause. Sure. Do you want to be the one band that did that to look at the other musicians in your community and say, I got paid? You know, I, I don't know that that's great for your brand no. either. No, I, I was just I, I just wanted to make sure as a, you know, tangentially that, that no one should feel beholden to a contract they haven't yet signed. You can negotiate. Things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's it, it's worth asking. Like you can have an if someone hands you a contract, you can have an adult conversation with that person about that contract. Like this is uh, not uh, up to a point, though. Yeah, up to that, a point. Like what you said is is actually the most useful lesson here. Take those three clauses, no pay, yeah, no full pass, and, an, and a radius clause. You now have a pretty good idea where these organizers are coming where, from. Yeah, you, you may not be worth picking up the phone to make that exactly. call. I mean, totally. You, you know, yeah. you can read into contracts. Absolutely. If someone goes all the way to zero to make you negotiate to 50, and they, they were really willing to go to 75, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know that that's really the right you, – you'd, like you'd like a contract – that starts in the realm of fair and leaves room for win-win. If, yes. if it starts in the realm of lose and it's your job to get it up to almost fair, I don't think that's a good situation. No, it's not. No, you're totally right. Like this, the contract, I, and I do this actually on the flip side too. Like when we're dealing, you know, with our backbeat media business, we represent podcasters and website publishers uh, to advertisers. And we always put a contract in place with those publishers Ahead of time, right? Because that way we know how the deal's going to work. It's just simple. And we keep our contract really simple. But I put the boilerplate contract in front of these people at a very early stage of our discussions. And it's because it's a great thing from which to have those discussions, right? It's like, hey, look, I'm just going to send you this. And let's let's talk about it. In theory, I've already told you the highlights of what you're going to read. There shouldn't be any surprises. But read it and let's talk and then let's use that to craft what our relationship will look like going forward. Like that, that's an okay thing to do. But my goal is when I hand someone that contract, they read it and they're like, Oh wow, these guys are really fair. Like they, they're, they're in business to, for everybody to win. They don't see this as a zero sum game. Like there's a lot of communication that we've thought about that goes into that, you know, offhanded boilerplate contract, right? Smart. Yeah. And, well, because that it's going to happen anyway. Like if if you give if somebody gives me a contract, suddenly like I'm there with a sharp pencil and a, you know, a lot of focus and I'm now learning something about you. And you need to know that other people are doing that, you know, in return and that's okay. Uh, so, yeah, in this scenario, like, what's the point of dealing with like, I know this if somebody sent me a contract like the one that was described for the Santa Clara thing, I, it would be like, what's the point of having a conversation? I know even if I get all the things I ask for, I've gotten screwed out of something that I didn't ask for and probably shouldn't have had to. But this person's going to be a stickler for these details. Not worth it. Or maybe not it worth is it. worth it, but I don't it doesn't sound like it's worth it to me. Often yeah. not. Often not. <laughs> Yeah. Often people, not. people yeah. will tell you who they are in many different ways. They will communicate right. that in several ways. That's right. Yeah. That's, that's a shame, man. I, that's not cool, but you know, whatever. 
All right. That's whatever. So, it's fine. That's what I got. That's what I got. Yeah. Oh, I have one more thing. Um, I was I was playing a, a, a sort of a last minute gig, acoustic gig with Amanda actually just last night. And um, our guitar player, CJ, was talking about a previous gig where he had like a bunch of people coming up and like gazing at his pedal board at set break or whatever. And of course, some of them, I'm sure you've experienced this, Paul, you know, will get too close or whatever. And it starts to feel a little, you know, like, eh, can you leave my stuff alone? I want to go <laughs> like to the bathroom and I don't trust you like that scenario. And so I hope CJ doesn't mind me sharing this, but I don't think he does. His, uh, his, his, his thought was, I'm going to get a sign and put it in small print on my pedal board facing out, you know, so that somebody that comes up and leans over is reading it right, you know, right side up. And it says, stop looking at my pedal board and go talk to a woman. <laughs> what if it's a woman talking or what yeah that, 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 yeah no that, there's a little risk right, in that there's a little risk in well it, it, it needs some it, like the spirit is there it, it perhaps needs yeah. some some iteration to get it to a talk a, to a human might talk be to a human there you go that's even better that's right yeah that's right so um and amanda amanda actually laughed about it and, and she actually asked that question she's like well what if it's a girl and she's like Actually, I've never seen a woman do that. So maybe you're safe, CJ. <laughs> so there you go. Hopefully Simon's listening to this because he's got a, a yeah. literal, you know, take me to Mars amount of gear on his pedal board now. <laughs> and it is it's a good conversation starter for sure. It, yeah. If you want it to be that. But if you, you want it to be yeah, that. you kind of I guess when you've got as many pedals as Simon has, you're, you're inviting kinda, it. You're inviting it. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. For sure. <laughs> All right. Do we have F anything that. else? Should we, um, leave the, the, should we leave the uh, pace of evolving your song list for a future episode? Yeah, because it's okay. um, yeah, that, I, I think next week is a good one to get into that because I'm living it right now. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Real quick okay. before we go, though, uh, we just did our, our last gig with our trombone player, Kevin Bryson, who's a great guy, a great musician. He's uh, he left the band because he's going to go. He's moving out of the area to get a master's in music so he can be a college music teacher. And, and so we wish him very well. He's been a great, great addition to our band. He's fun to play with. Very serious musician, you know, in terms of, you know, he's always ready. He's just focused. He's just a, he's a great player. He's a great guy and has been a great bandmate. So I just want to wish him well in his future endeavors. I, I've always liked that dude whenever I've uh, had the yep. pleasure to interact with and play with him. So, yeah, that I hope it, it all works out even better than he imagines. That's great. Yeah. And nice yeah. thing is we have an, an old trombone player is going to come back and take most of the gigs that Kevin couldn't make for the rest of the year, which oh, is kind nice. of fun. Be that's like old cool. Yeah, that's actually it's it is fun playing with old you know, old friends that, that you haven't played with in a while. I mean, For usually, sure. unless it's like the two guys you mentioned on the street in Tahoe, but you know, whatever, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, like, that. you know, F that. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good stuff. All right, folks. Well, that's, uh, I think we better stop. We better quit while we're ahead here. <laughs> Uh, thanks to Banzoogle, banzoogle.com. Remember, promo code GIGGAB to get your 15% off of that first year. Good stuff. What do you have to say, Mr. Kent? I'm just going to remind everybody, always be performing. Always. Always.